Hello, everyone. Uh, Sara, we are now live. It This session particularly is, I mean, I would say all of them are my favorite, but Sara is definitely, you know, someone that I truly deeply admire, and I say it with all my heart. Um, when we spoke last time, I mentioned to Sara how, how hurt I felt and, and how different of a conversation is when being in a space with you. And so I just wanted to say that before we start oh, the session. Thank you. Um, and, and I'm gonna share with you guys a little bit more about Sarah and then I'm gonna leave the space for Sarah to, to go and, and share her amazing work. So Sarah is a blind Muslim, a first generation American. I'm just gonna add Sarah, a first generation activist. <laughs> Sarah Mankara has spent her life on a journey towards not only acceptance, but also a real empowerment for herself and everyone she meets. Building on experiences at Harvard University, the United Nations, multinational companies, and not-for-profit organizations. Sarah is unique. Sarah's Unique's programs offer individual and groups alike authentic leadership solutions to recognize each other's voice and value and to deconstruct the social narratives that often inaccurately define us. So Sarah, welcome. And I'm going to leave this space to you. And I'm going to be here um, back, back in the behind the scenes. Awesome. Thank you, Ingrid. Well, first of all, Ingrid, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored and excited to be with you and everyone here. Um, and uh, I'm excited to kind of have this conversation with all of you guys. I'm going to start just to give you a little bit of a high level. I'm going to start introduce myself, uh, a little bit of my background. And I'm going to dive into this whole theme of, you know, vision beyond sight. So I am a daughter. I'm a sister. I am a friend, a colleague, a neighbor. In a lot of spaces, I am a troublemaker. I love horses, I love coffee, I love to eat chicken, I love the color green. I love audiobooks, I love to travel. I love to hang out with my friends. I am a woman, I am Muslim, I am blind, I am a person with a disability and I'm very proud of it. When I was seven years old, to be exactly on my birthday, I woke up that day and my world was completely altered. I had lost most of my vision. I went from a life where I could see to a life where I could no longer see. We were in our summer house that overlooked these beautiful mountains and I could no longer see them. I remember calling out to my mom and my mom coming over and realizing that her second daughter has also become blind. Two years previously, my sister at age seven also had lost most of her vision. She hugged me really tightly and she said, Sara, everything is going to be okay. And everything was okay. Yes, the technical aspect of being blind is, could be very challenging, but everything was okay because of my mom, my family, and the community around me, where my mom pushed me to embrace all of who I am, push me to embrace my disability, help me see the strength behind the disability instead of the narrative that's embraced in society when it comes to disability. She did not allow the lack of expectation towards disability to ever enter our home. She never allowed us to say, I cannot do this because then I cannot see. She encouraged us to be young people with dreams and ambitions. She used to always tell me, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? And you're going to do it. We were empowered. We were seen. We were heard. And because of that, I lived a very full life. I went to the regular public school systems in my town. I was able to go to Wellesley, study math economics, go to Harvard. I was even able to hike and slide down a volcano in Nicaragua. I lived a, a very much beautiful life. And that's not because I have more value. That's because I had the privilege, and I call it privilege, because I had the privilege of being seen and heard as an individual with potential. But unfortunately, most people with disabilities across the globe are not living that narrative. They're living a narrative of, poor you. I feel bad for you. You're a burden on society. There's something wrong with you that needs to be fixed. 
I guess we have to, you know, have you in society. But you know what? You're not going to amount to anything. That's the common narrative surrounding disability. And because of that, the people with disabilities are marginalized, pushed to the side, and we lose out on their value. And in recognizing the reality of, of kids with disabilities across the globe, I started my first organization, Empowerment Integration, an international nonprofit that focuses on disrupting the narrative surrounding disability, moving from a charity lens to a value-based lens, from a charity perspective to a value-based perspective, not human rights, value-based. And I'm saying that very intentionally. Yes, human rights is important, but that, that's the baseline because when we stop at human rights, what ends up happening? We end up at the point of saying, I guess we have to employ, we have to educate, we have to integrate because that's the right thing to do. But I want to come to a point in society where society says, I want to include people with disabilities because when I don't, I lose out on their value. The inclusion of all is a value for all. And I learned that important lesson actually when I was in grad school. I was in a leadership class. We were in a classroom full of 100 students, and each person had a name card. And that name card helped people really know who's speaking, and it helped the you know in classmates engage with one another. So in the beginning of the semester, I'm like, can you please say your name when you're speaking? Because that's going to help me access the class. The professor was like, no, 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 no. I'm like, what do you mean? No, that is my right. I can't ask for, ask, ask for my right. He's like, the way you phrase it is wrong. He's like, the way you should, you should rephrase it in a way by saying that by them making the classroom accessible to you, that means you're able to access the class, that means you're able to contribute, that means you're able to bring value forward, which means it's a value for them. It's a value for everyone in the class. It's, they're not doing you a favor, they're doing themselves a favor. So it goes back to this point. The inclusion of all is a value for all. So we focus on disrupting that narrative both on societal level, but also at the individual level. Because what ends up happening, if you are a person with disabilities and all you've been dealing with is this narrative, poor you, you're nothing, you're a burden, you start embracing that. You start believing that. So we started focusing on getting kids with disabilities saying, I am proud of who I am. I am proud of my disability. I'm proud of all of who I am. I belong, I exist, and I'm going to contribute. It's both ways. This was 10 years ago, and it, I've been running it for the past 10 years. But I wanted to kind of really branch out and bring things a bit further beyond disability. And that's why I started my, next, my second company. And this is where I focus on inclusion as a whole. I'm going to ask all of us a question right now, and I want you guys all to think about this. Every single one of us in this virtual room has been marginalized at one point in time. Everyone, in some ways or another. Everyone has been labeled or judged in some point in time. Let's think about those moments. Labeled or judged because of maybe our race, our gender, our disability, our age, our ethnicity, our religion, and so much more. Now imagine you are in a space where no one can see you and you cannot see anyone. Imagine. You're not able to see one another. You're not able to see body language and facial expressions. You're not able to see um, you know, many labels, which leads you're not able to make a lot of these assumptions and people cannot make assumptions towards you. That constraint of not seeing gives us the freedom of actually seeing. Think about when you're, if you're in a space like that, how would you behave? How does your behavior change? You become more comfortable being yourself. You become comfortable bringing more of, of who you are. And this is exactly what we focus on is how can we promote authentic leadership? How can we bring forward more value to society? How can we really be able to help every single one of us bring our true self forward? 
Because when we're in a space and we feel judged and labeled, what ends up happening? You start hiding or, or prevent one or more of your self or identities. Or you start tailoring what you're going to say because you're afraid of being judged. You start tailoring your behavior. And when that happens, you're not able to bring your true self forward. And when that happens, you're not able to bring your full value forward. And when that happens, society is also losing out on that value. So we've developed this really unique methodology called the In the Dark Methodology, where we bring forward this constraint of not seeing to give you the freedom of actually seeing. But our goal is not for people not to see. Let me be real. Our goal is not for people to like, okay, I'm going to close my eyes. Yes, I am blind. I, I, you know, and, I, and, and I, I do see my blindness as a superpower in, in many ways. But our goal is not for people to go around and not see. No. Our goal is to actually create this realization and the recognition of how much labels and assumptions and narratives impact us on both sides. How much these narratives impact what we bring forward. Think about what part of yourself sometimes you're not bringing forward and why. But then it also helps us recognize what are the narratives we are contributing to. Because we're all contributing to these narratives. All of us. In our own way. And in recognizing that, and in really getting the understanding that I actually have the power within me to empower others to bring their authentic self forward. I have the power within me to really help sh shift and shape more authentic spaces. And in doing so, values brought forward, and in doing so, we're able to create better s solutions, decisions, and policies. I'm going to leave us with a few really important kind of takeaways. How do we do that? Of course, we're not going through the workshop right now, and we cannot. But there's a few important takeaways I always talk about. First, be curious and compassionate with yourself and with others. Curiosity through, les through the lens of compassion. Ask, constantly ask your, yourself, how am I behaving? Why am I behaving this way? Am I, am I not embracing all of who I am? And if so, why not? Am I also creating assumptions in society? And if so, why? But do it through a lens of compassion. The more we understand ourselves and understand our behavior, the more we're going to actually be able to really realize how we can change things. But also be curious and compassionate with others. You know, I want people to come to me and ask me questions about my disability. I do want. But I want it to be asked through a lens of compassion, not assumption. The more we engage one another by asking and saying, tell me who you are. Who are you? I want to hear your voice. I want to hear your authentic self. I'm not going to come to you with an assumption of who you are. I'm going to come with a lens of compassion to really wanting to know who you are. And if you approach every single dialogue with that approach, you're actually helping to create an empowering space towards authenticity. That's number one. Number two is approach every single person with one assumption and only one assumption. That this person has something beautiful to contribute. Imagine you approach every single person with that, with that lens. You're empowering that person. I'm going to take it. I'm, take, I'm going to ask a question. All of us are in this room, and we've been empowered at one point in time. How were we empowered? Someone saw, at least one person saw us, heard us, valued us, and said, you are going to be someone um, with, con with value. And I truly believe that every single person in this world has something beautiful to contribute. Every single person. So when you start approaching a person with that assumption, you're also part of creating that empowering space. And my last point is really, truly believing that we all have the power within us to make a difference. 
there's no there's nothing being too young there's nothing being too old there's nothing being too um no i'm not senior enough in my company i'm not whatever no every single one of us has the power to make a difference in someone else's life every single one of us has the power to help bring authenticity forward i truly believe that and you can start off with your neighbor. You can start off with your colleague. If you're in a space, in a work setting where you you see some colleagues, their voices are not heard, you can start off by really initiating those conversation. Inclusion in many spaces is, stops at a technical lens. Let's make sure everyone is in the room. Let's make sure everyone is represented and has, has, has a seat at the table. But it does not stop there. The question is, is everyone comfortable expressing their true self voices and perspective? And a lot of times in spaces, that's no. So that's what we do. That's what I focus, is on, focus on, authentic leadership to drive better solutions, decisions, and policies through a value-based lens. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with me today. And if there's any questions, Grit and Grit is going to help me. Yes, and I just uh, popped in here, so I'm right next to you. And I'm just going to read some of the comments because there's a lot of them. But it says that you're, I mean, you know this, you're amazing. I did have some tears while you were speaking. Um, a true, true activist. Um, Sara said I'm from northern area of Pakistan. Ooh, I love you, I love Sarah. It. I love you. I love you. Many loves you. Aww. You're very loved right now, hijabi queen. <laughs> <laughs> uh real inspiration the moment of rise we really love the idea of how the way we might judge of being judged connected to the very okay i totally read that wrong. i'm gonna read it again really love the idea of how the way we might judge of being judged connected to the very fact of us seeing or not seeing mm. Thank you for sharing. Sarah, this is so powerful. You have removed a veil from my eyes. Humane have the tendency to auto-rejection and damaging themselves. That's very true. Okay. Well, there's a lot more, you know, he does. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Okay, so let's do some questions. Um, yes, Elizabeth just posted. How do you go about every day happily? Um, oh, how do I go about every day Karen. happily? Um, I mean, so work is a lot, brings a lot of happiness to me. So that's, I mean, a big part of my, what brings happiness is my, my work and my purpose. Um, beyond that, um, for me, spending time with people that I love, nature, coffee, eating really good food and traveling. So, um, and, and for me also, my, my faith brings me a lot of happiness and serenity and yeah, but to be honest, my day is consumed a lot with work. <laughs> so Amazing. And then Rana Rafal, uh, you probably can pronounce that better. Al Rafal. Uh, I do know Rana, but she says, do you have a harder time with being hurt since you're a hijabi and a Muslim? And she is also a Muslim. Oh, um, that's a really good question. Um, to be honest, um, you know, so yes, I, I, I deal with, you know, I, as a blind Muslim woman, you know, I deal with ableism, Islamophobia and many times and sexism, but to be honest, the main thing I deal with is ableism. The first thing that people interact with me, it's very fascinating actually, is my disability. And and I will say, again, by being blind, it's actually been really empowering for me because when I enter a space, I don't know how people are looking at me. I don't know how people are seeing me. So I'm really much my true self, right? And even if I might be, you know, sometimes my friends are like, Sarah, they're staring at you. I'm like, well, you didn't have to tell me. Um, so, uh, you know, so there's that level of, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm comfortable in my in my space many times. And then I think that when you, and this is actually another uh, teaching moment from another professor, he's like, when you enter a room and you come in and you believe that you belong and you're going to contribute, people are going to change their perceptions towards you, even if they have an, a different perception in the beginning. And that's actually been really helpful. So I'll just enter and I'm like, you know, I belong. I'm going to contribute. So, yeah. Wow. I, I can tell I have a trampoline, Sarah, in my office. <laughs> and so 
<laughs> before I go into meetings where I know I'm like definitely the, the most naive, I jump in my trampoline so that I can get a little bit more hyped. Oh, um, I like this. <laughs> yeah. And then I have another question. So Sarah, like, as a woman belonging to Indian occupied Kashmir conflict zone, our narratives are often faced with a constant tone policing and gaslighting. Mm -hmm. How to make people realize the rage needs validation and acceptance. Marginalized will be angry and will not use fancy language while sharing. Am I making sense? I, I didn't get it, but I think you did. I, I think what, yeah, I think what's, what's, you know, I think what's being asked or said is that, you know, and this is where, okay, I'm going to say a few things. So yes, when people are being marginalized and their voices are not heard, that's going to lead towards, you know, this is going to lead towards anger or frustration, whatever. And I think this is where we need to be creating spaces where everyone's voices is heard equally. And, um, and this is where I connect with this point. Some, I say this and people are going to yell at me by saying this, but um, I'm not a big fan of the word empathy. I do like empathy, but I'm not the big, big fan of the word empathy in many ways when it comes to this kind of conversations, because when I say I empathize with you, you're almost like taking away that person's voice because I can mm -hmm. never, ever know what you're going through mm -hmm. and your experiences and your voice. I can never. And that's why I always say curiosity through a lens of compassion, because you want to create a space where you creating that dialogue and asking and letting that person's to voice and experience really be brought forward. And that's what needs to be happening, especially with, with marginalized groups. Mm. So, so I, my face, my head is just going up and down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to add, have you ever heard, uh, I, I was reading a book and they talked about this of like, I love you no matter what. Have you heard that? <laughs> that's also kind of the same as empathy yes. being like, yeah. you're yeah. already bringing your bias. And so that's the perfect next question. Yep. So sense guy is asking, how do you recognize when you're being biased? Oh, that's a good question. Um, sometimes very upfront. Um, but anyways, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, I, I, I've been in meetings where people would not talk towards me. They would talk to the person next to me because they're uncomfortable talking to a person with a disability or someone's blind. Like I've, I've had to that blunt, you know, as, as blunt as that. But listen, sometimes you know, sometimes you don't know. And sometimes we actually think we have some people, some people are being biased towards us, right? We, we can or cannot know. And this is where I say, create that dialogue, initiate that dialogue. You know, a lot of us with people with disabilities, we get frustrated because a lot of people approach us and say, oh my God, how are you living your life? Oh, you're so amazing. You're so inspiring. Um, this is amazing. I, I can't believe this. your life must be so hard and you know, everything. Listen, they're coming from a good place, right? But they're, if you, if you dissect what they're saying, there's a lot of bias there, right? Mm -hmm. The bias is that your disability is, you know, X, Y, and Z. And a lot of us people with disabilities, we get frustrated and, and, and tired of that, right? And some people shut down. What I always say, let's actually not shut down and let's open that conversation and let's talk back. Let's, I mean, not, you know, let's, let's, let's talk with that person. Let's really initiate and really, because the more we do that, the more, more that we mitigate some gaps of bias, but it's hard. Mm -hmm. And I cannot, I cannot ask that of everyone because yes, it is hard. It is a burden some at times to be like, to always needing to create, help create that dialogue. So. Mm, how powerful. And then we, we have five minutes left, Sarah, but we have three who's saying how to increase self-confidence and be heard by others, which I think you kind of mentioned, but if you have another tip. Um, yeah, I mean, so, What's important is, you know, a lot of people, I always talk about how did you end up where you are? What does it take for you not to let society dictate who you are, right? Because a lot of times we allow society's narratives to impact how we see ourselves. How do we not let society do that? How do we choose our own path and our own value? And a lot of times people say, well, you know, having self-confidence, right? Having the, having the, the, the courage and the bravery and all that kind of stuff. But none of us have our have confidence just from air like it doesn't come from a snap of you know your fingers from for all of us it took at least one person to have seen and recognized and empowered us and i want us to all reflect on who's that at least that one person who's done that for us in our life 
And that is the formula. And that's how you can do that, how you can provide that for other people as well. Hmm. I'm becoming very emotional. Um, Anna Mejia says, I just want to say thank you, Sarah, because we often try to include others that are different, but we don't know how. And in my case, in my case, I am sometimes afraid to ask what I can do. But what you said today really changes my perspective. Oh, thank you. And then I know we have three minutes left. Crystal says, how can we share these concepts with young girls? Do you have any suggestions? Oh, um, so, I mean, there's a few ways. Um, uh, we can definitely, I mean, we can definitely communicate. You can guys definitely get in touch with um, my myself and my team. Um, on our website, our email, I don't know how we can share that maybe over chat, but yeah. definitely get in touch with us. And bit of sharing, so uh -oh. make sure you, yeah. yeah. Perfect, um, because we do a lot of work with young kids all the way up to uh, adults in companies, et cetera, so. Yeah, and Crystal is the founder of um, uh, GEMS, which is uh, Girls Empowered Mentally for Success, so I definitely think there will be a lot of synergies, Crystal. Amazing. Yeah, and then Rana says, I think not being afraid of failure and making mistakes can improve your self-confidence. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, KM says, my professor in school pointed out that we are all temporarily able-bodied. True and that. And reminds me <laughs> to continue to make a size to like folks know they are valued. <laughs> <laughs> We always say that this is a early world. Everyone, everyone else is temporarily, temporarily able to handle it. Yeah, and then uh, Joey Smith, uh, Smith. Sorry again for my pronunciation. The time is way too short. There are so many topics and questions coming up. What needs to be changed in society for visual? Okay, I'm definitely reading wrong. I'm so sorry, Sarah. No, no, says, no. We're just <clears throat> what needs to be changed in society for visual disabled people? Oh, what needs to be changed in society for visually impaired people? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, man. Um, I always say the biggest obstacles, and it's not just people with visual impairment, the biggest obstacle for visual impaired folks and other people with disabilities is actually the stigma. Mm -hmm. That's our biggest obstacle. When that stigma and that narrative of ableism is no longer existing, to be honest, our technical aspect of being disabled is, you know, <laughs> so it's it's the stigma. It's our, let's destigmatize disability in our workspace and education space and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And we just have one minute left. Um, so I'm just going to say thank you. I, I deeply felt every word that you say, you said today, just like anytime I, I speak to you. Um, and there's a lot of thank yous from the audience. Um, and again, thank you, Sarah, for giving us the space, for sharing your story in such a vulnerable, real, authentic way, which I think a lot of us are scared to do. And just the fact, you know, before the session, I said, I love your introduction because I just, <laughs> not a lot of us do that, right? And when I was a part of your session, it was like removing all of these labels that we have as human beings that we forget. So thank yes. you. Of course. Thank you, Ingrid, for having me. And thank you, everyone. This was a wonderful conversation with everyone. Thank you. Go to the next session. Bye, everyone. Bye.